And now with this week's special guest, here's your host, Eric Townsend. I said last week that this is a major variant perception moment for me. Uh, I think the risk to the already vulnerable oil market from a further escalation of the Israel-Gaza conflict is extremely high. To my own surprise, though, our very well-respected colleague, Dr. Anas Alhaji, has a much more moderate view of the extent of that risk. So to balance my own admittedly strong views, I'm going to invite Anas on in just a couple of minutes to give us a quick update. But let me first start by explaining my own views on this developing systemic risk to the oil markets. First of all, macro voices will take no sides in this conflict between Israel and Hamas. As financial journalists, our job is to report objectively on what geopolitical developments are likely to mean to financial markets, not to opine on the merits of the events themselves. So my view begins with understanding that the global oil market is already very fragile. With the exception of Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, OPEC is already producing at capacity. Everyone is assuming that rational expectations theory is going to continue to apply. In other words, any country that's got oil and is in the business of producing oil is going to sell their oil at the highest price they possibly can because that's what's in their economic best interest. And everyone assumes that they will just continue doing that indefinitely. I think that's the dangerous assumption. The Russia-Ukraine war already poses the risk of the stakes rising to levels where I think there's a chance that Russia could take an economically irrational action, such as not selling all of the oil that it's producing, in order to prosecute a political agenda, such as cutting oil production for the intentional purpose of weaponizing oil prices. Even though that doesn't seem to be in Russia's economic interest, it may be that they put higher priority on their political agenda than their economic agenda. Now we have this Israel Arab relations situation blowing up in a way that's not going to blow over anytime soon. Again, we're not taking any sides on who's right or wrong in this conflict. My point is simply that an escalation has occurred that cannot possibly be undone. The atrocities on both sides, the extent of just how much violence has occurred in the last few weeks, cannot be undone or forgotten. So there's going to be a long standing rise in geopolitical tensions in this area. Now, there's no significant oil production in Israel or Gaza, so there's no direct risk here. The, re the risk is from a broader regional conflict developing to the point where some of the oil producing nations begin to make economically irrational decisions in support of a political agenda. Now, they don't have the option of increasing their oil production in reaction to any geopolitical situation because most of them are already producing as much as they can. The question is, are there scenarios where we might be assuming they're going to continue to sell all of their oil and they don't do so? I think that's a very high risk, but Dr. Anas Alhaji, who's very, very knowledgeable on this subject, actually has a more modest view. So let's bring in Dr. Anas Alhaji now. Anas, some people are saying it's 1973 all over again, oil embargo. We're going to see tripling of oil prices. Other people say, no, 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 no. Look, there's no significant oil production in Israel or Gaza. This is irrelevant to oil and gas markets. Uh, I've got to believe it's somewhere in between. Which is it? And also, is it just about oil or is gas a different story than oil? I think you summarized it very well here. We have to remember the following. There were three embargoes uh, historically. The first one was in 1956. That was imposed by Saudi Arabia on the UK and France uh, when they attacked Egypt after Egypt nationalized the Swiss Canal. And then we have the embargo of 1967. That's during the war. And then that was several countries, not only Saudi Arabia, about seven countries, seven Arab countries imposed the embargo. Both of them failed and failed miserably. And the first one was symbolic. The second one, they tried to do something, but it did not work. And then in 1973, we had an issue here because on the 17th of October, uh, yesterday was the 50th anniversary of, the, of that, the uh, ministers recommended an embargo. On the 18th, we had two countries that imposed the embargo. Then on the 19th, Saudi Arabia joined them and the announcement was official 
of imposing an embargo that was associated with a production cut to make the embargo more effective. And the embargo was on three countries, the United States, Denmark, and the Netherlands. And what we see here is this was a total failure. And this fits with the literature. We have a literature of 120 years that covered all kinds of sanctions from all countries. We have hundreds and hundreds of events, and each one of them failed. And the embargo fits with that. It did not work. Why it did not work? Because the first thing is, what was the objective of the embargo? The objective of the embargo was to force Israel to the borders of 1967, or what they called the UN Resolution 242, and stop the Western support for Israel. That was in 1973. Now look at now. Israel expanded, and the support is stronger than ever. And we have President Biden today there. So it failed miserably because the declared objectives of the embargo were not achieved. And when we say declared, because there could be some other unknown objectives, and I'm going to allude to that in a minute, uh, of the embargo. And if the unclear, undeclared objectives basically are correct, then those countries achieve their objective. But the, object, the two declared objectives of returning Israel to 1967 borders and to stop the Western support to Israel, both of them were not achieved. The embargo lasted for about two months. The, the, the actual embargo lasted for about two months, but the official embargo ended four months later. What's strange about that is this. Uh, people think that this was an OPEC embargo. It wasn't an OPEC embargo. It was several Arab countries who did this. OPEC has Arab countries, non-Arab countries, including Iran and Venezuela, Indonesia, and others. So it wasn't OPEC. Was it AWAPEC that the Arab oil producing countries? No, it wasn't because there were other uh, Arab members did not participate in the embargo. But the issue here is this, that they say that oil prices quadrupled because of the embargo. That is another mistake. They did not quadruple because of the embargo, because two days earlier, before the embargo, OPEC met and increased posted prices by 70%. Posted prices are the prices that are used at that time to calculate taxes, because there was no price of oil in the market at that time. No one knew what the price of oil in the market, because the companies, the oil majors, were vertically integrated. They sold within the company itself. So the producer sold to the refiner and the refiner sold to the distributor, but all of them are the same company. So we have some sort of transfer pricing, but no one knew what the price is. So they have to come up with something to measure taxes. So they came up with the posted prices. So by increasing the prices by 70% unilaterally, they forced the companies basically, or, or they increased the cost of the companies significantly. And the companies, since they are integrated, they had to pass it to the consumer. So prices went up because of that. So we cannot say that the embargo increased prices by fourfold. The embargo itself was, again, based on the declared objectives, was a complete failure. However, there is, and, and I'm, I'm speaking academically here. Studies that been done on this concluded the following. The embargo achieved its objectives. And what were the objectives? Arab nationalism at that time was very strong. Communists in the Arab world were, were kind of really strong, and some of them basically in power. And many people, even in the Gulf countries, were either Arab nationalists or communists. And that was a threat to the existing governments that were supporters of the United States. And the idea here is, if it wasn't for the embargo, the Soviet Union would have controlled the area. And we would not have seen the oil flow for the last 50 years coming from the Middle East to the United States and Europe. So they had the embargo literally to pull the rug from beneath the communist and Arab nationalists so you don't see the Arabs led by Cairo or Damascus or Baghdad. Now it is led by Riyadh, Kuwait, 
and Abu Dhabi. So if that's the objective, it was achieved. So this is the undeclared objective in this case. But it was a total failure. Why? Because the suffering of those countries in the 80s when the market collapsed was massive. Massive to the extent that those governments almost went bankrupt. And everything in those economies just stalled, completely stalled. There was no money. Imagine that in 1985 and 86, Saudis had to cut production from 10 million barrels a day to two. So the cut alone was more than the exports of Saudi Arabia today. The cut was 8 million barrels a day. Yet, oil prices continue to decline. Not the, as if this is not enough. We lost the Iraqi oil. We lost the Iranian oil. So we lost this 8 million from Saudi Arabia. And we lost about 5 million from Iraq and Iran. And yet, prices continue to decline. Why? Because high prices in the 70s, after the embargo, led to the building of the Alaska pipeline. That's 2.5 million barrels a day. Then the North Sea came in online. That was 3 million barrels a day. Then we, we found oil in more than 15 countries. They did not discover oil before. So we had more oil than ever. At the same time, look what, what we did in the United States. We, we, we helped establish the International Energy Agency which is a headache for OPEC and Saudi Arabia right now. They started the SPR, the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, which is a big headache for OPEC. They established the Department of Energy, which is spending billions of dollars on renewable energy, EVs and batteries and everything else. And we had the speed limit that increased the efficiency. We had the CAFE standards that enhanced the, and improved the efficiency of engines and reduced gasoline consumption big time. We have all those efforts between Europe, the United States, Japan, and others that reduced the demand significantly. So we ended up with lower demand and massive increase in supply and nothing. The efforts of Saudi Arabia and the loss of Iraqis and Iranian oil did not even help improve prices. And those countries suffered for more than a decade. So the idea here is they paid the price heavily for it. They learned from it. They know that oil cannot be used as a weapon. They have three experiences. It failed every time. They lost market share. It takes between eight years to 15 years to recover market share. So the, the bottom line here is do not expect the oil weapon to be used again. Anas, I want to fast forward to today based on what you just said. You're saying it sounds like governments are not likely to invoke this oil weapon because it hasn't really worked effectively in the past. But in terms of public sentiment, a whole bunch of uh, very strong public anger is being developed on both sides of this conflict. And in the Muslim world, in the Arab world, certainly the politics is get, it's leading to riots and so forth all over the place. If there are not likely to be governments weaponizing oil as a, or the, the oil price tool, the way you're saying, what about terrorist organizations and others that might be reacting to just the public sentiment that's now occurring? I think probably if you look at oil prices and the increase that we've seen, which is about almost $7 now, what we call the political premium, is really because of that. But forget about the Iranian statements about the use of the, of the weapon because the Iranians have been saying this for 40 years. In fact, today on my Twitter feed, I posted a statement by uh, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, the former president of Iran, who said something like this exactly after the Israeli army basically went to Gaza and killed a lot of people. And he said, oh, we need to impose an oil embargo. Uh, and you can see it, you can read it. It is on my Twitter feed. So these are all things. But the fear, these, this is real that individuals or organizations can wreak havoc on the oil industry. Why? Because the technology improved substantially in recent years that with like a few hundred dollars, you can literally cause problems to a major oil tanker or a major oil facility. Drone for two, three hundred dollars basically uh, can help do that. So the, the improvement in technology enabled individuals and smaller groups to cause major damage. And this is a real possibility because people are looking at their governments and they think that their governments are not doing enough. And therefore they are angry at their governments 
as much as they are angry at the Israelis. So this is a real threat. On a final question, let's talk about gas versus oil. Is it the same story or are they different and why are they different? This is a completely different story. And the reason why, because Israel has three gas fields and Israel exports natural gas to Egypt and Jordan. And Tamar field, you can see the Tamar field from the uh, Gaza beaches. It's too close to Gaza. So they closed it. And closing Tamar basically means reduction of gas to, uh, to Egypt, reduction of gas to Jordan, and not enough gas within Israel. And that is a problem because the other two fields cannot compensate for Tamar. And therefore, Egypt cannot re-export the gas in the form of LNG to Europe. So the impact is on Europe. And the Jordanians are not going to have a major energy crisis because of that, and they have to resort to LNG. As for the Israelis, and this sounds like really strange, the only way for the Israelis basically to compensate is to import more coal. And that's a problem because the Israeli left and the uh, Israeli climate activists are going to go crazy when their country is going to import more coal to, to burn in power plants. So we'll see how they are going to justify that. But the main outcome of all of this is the, this conflict, the final nail in the coffin of any gas pipeline from the Eastern Mediterranean to Europe. What we are seeing right now, the options for Europe to substitute Russian gas are dwindling. And the only two options left are the United States and Qatar. And therefore, I, we believe that Russian gas will continue to flow to Europe for a very long time. Honest, I can't thank you enough for joining us for this update. Before I let you go, just tell our listeners where they can find your Twitter feed and your Substack if they want to follow your analysis in more depth. Sure. Uh, everything we talked about today and others, basically, we already published reports on that. Uh, and uh, we have it on Substack. They can go to my Twitter account, Anas al A-N-A-S-A-L-H-A-J-J-I, and, and they can get all the information from my bio there or my, uh, uh, my tweets. So all the information is there. Thanks so much for joining us, Anas. We look forward to getting you back for a feature interview as our schedule permits. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly research roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at macrovoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna, shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com. <laughs>